Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine that we put together here for you at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. My name is Joe Thomas, and you can find out more about us, what we do, our Tuesday morning group coalition, our advocacy, uh, some of the issues we have delved into, and some of our successes we've had legislatively by going to our website, tertiumquids.com. Dot org. Earlier this week, the Pew Research Center, uh, in an effort to continue the two-front war of first telling you we need to vote for everything and then say, well, except for all your neighbors who don't know anything about anything, uh, issued a study that said um, uh, most Americans don't know fact from fiction when it comes to uh, what they drive their decision-making on. And I thought, interestingly, one of those points was how much of our budget is used in Social Security uh, uh, and in uh, other entitlement funds. Uh, so to join us to kind of get get us back into an issue that's going to continue to drive the conversation in Virginia for a while, Medicaid expansion, Medicare, Social Security, and the entitlement spending, uh, Chuck Blahaus uh, from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, Chuck, uh, welcome back to the program. How are you doing this weekend, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, no, uh, not at all. E- entitlement spending is one of those phrases that gets – kicked around like a soccer ball at the World Cup, and it, it, it comes down to agreements where, whether we agree they're constitutional or not, right now we're in that spot where uh, people have paid into Social Security, they're expecting to get out of Social Security, Medicare as well. Uh, it, talk about the budgetary impacts that we're seeing uh, as we demographically push the largest population boom in American history uh, into the Social Security system. Well, yes. Uh, Social Security and Medicare are, as you uh, suggested, they're the, they're the largest two federal entitlement programs. Uh, one of the one of the things that has befuddled me over the last couple of months there 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 are some memes online to the effect that uh, Social Security is not an entitlement program, which is absurd. Uh, Social Security is not only an entitlement program; it's the prototypical entitlement program. Mm. It's, it's the largest entitlement program, and any federal glossary that defines federal entitlement programs usually starts with Social Security as the prime example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you you really nailed it in your opening comments that uh, these are programs that have mandatory automatic spending authority. Uh, they don't have to have funds appropriated for them every year. And in in both uh, cases, Social Security and Medicare, they are indexed to automatically grow. Uh, each year from from one year to the next. So mm-hmm. right now they're about uh, between them they're about 42 percent of overall federal spending. And that's just for two programs wow. alone. Uh, and perhaps more concerningly, uh, both programs were recently um, re-estimated in the latest Social Security and Medicare trustees reports and found that their near-term finances uh, are in much worse shape than was previously projected. In fact, just a year ago, uh, a year ago the trustees were estimating that Social Security and Medicare hospital insurance would not have to start drawing down their respective trust funds till 2022 and 23, respectively. Uh, but the latest projections have them both starting to do that this year. Mm. And that's an, that's an absolutely stunning development. There's a lot of numbers that move around in the trustees reports from year to year. But that type of movement in the short term is very atypical and, uh, and shows that uh, the, the problems of these programs that were already extremely serious and urgent uh, are becoming more so. Talk about that. Take us in, in a little bit uh, of the historical artifacts in this, because I, I know that the Vox Populi will hear a lot of things around the barbecue pit uh, about, you know, uh, Congress using money from the Social Security Trust Fund. There isn't really a trust fund. I mean, everything from one side to another uh, it, it, about where the money went, or is it, as some folks will argue, that it's just a demographic, uh, we just don't have enough people paying into the pyramid scheme right now because the baby boom population is so big and they didn't have statistically very many children, uh, so the workforce is much smaller. Now, where is the truth, or is it somewhere in between all of that? Well, I I think your last summation is is the best one. There's a a kernel of truth even in the myths, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the truth is somewhere in between those different characterizations. This, the idea that Social Security uh, would be fine if politicians just hadn't raided the trust fund and spent all the money uh, is not true, uh, but there is a kernel of truth in it. There, there's a kernel of truth in the sense that the trust fund that Social Security holds 
does not represent saving in any real sense mm-hmm. of the word. I mean, the, the surplus taxes that Social Security collected in the past uh, were by law invested in federal treasuries, federal treasury securities, and uh, those, as you know, finance ongoing federal spending and consumption. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most economists, analysts who have looked at this, uh, who have studied it, have said uh, the, the effect of the federal government's access to that surplus Social Security revenue has basically caused the government to spend more money than they otherwise would have. And so, yes, there is a, I think there is a kernel of truth in, in, the, um, in the suggestion that the Social Security surpluses have been spent by politicians. Now, what's not true is that that is where the Social Security problem comes from. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the trust fund holds Treasury securities. The federal government has to pay them back and is already starting to pay them back. Uh, they earn interest on those Treasury securities, and they have the right to, to redeem the principal on those Treasury securities any time the program needs them. And so when the trustees project a shortfall in Social Security, it's not because the, the trust fund has been spent. That's actually a very, even though the trust fund is very large in nominal terms, it's, a, it's actually a very small part of overall federal operations. Um, the, the projections assume all that money is paid back plus interest. Uh, but there's an enormous problem on top of that which is that Social Security has promised a lot more in benefits than the uh, amount of worker contributions that it collects, plus mm-hmm. interest. And that is where the problem comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. And that's a, that's a hard truth for people to wrap their minds around, <laughs> because it, it means it can't be fixed unless you slow the growth of benefits, or um, it, some people would advocate uh, raising the program mm-hmm. taxes. Uh, but you have to do some combination of those things to align the program's benefit and tax schedules, or, or it's not going to work. Well, much has been made about, and derisively, you'll hear people say pyramid schemes and things like that. And and I've pointed out that you know even a pyramid scheme can work if you make sure that the bottom of the pyramid keeps being you know bigger than the top, and and that you can uh, collect that revenue. Uh, I guess at the onset, and the things I've read, the the belief was that this would force the American government to always make sure there was a good and vibrant economy because that would be uh, feeding the uh, engine of uh, of the retirement benefits and and that they never really were designed to be your retirement plan it was meant to be um, uh, an augmentation to what other uh, other retirements you might have uh, had as well correct in both cases or am I off the mark on that? no I, I think I think you've got it basically right and I'll, I'll try to answer this um, without making the history lesson too long because it's kind of it is complicated but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best um, uh, but uh, demographics are a big part of this, right? You had, uh, in the initial stages of the program, you had a lot more workers paying into the system than you had beneficiaries pulling out. Right. And a lot of things have combined to drive those numbers down over the years. We're, we're living a lot longer. We haven't really uh, raised eligibility ages to a very significant extent at all. Uh, but we're living, you know, on average about nine years longer than when Social Security was created. And then in addition to all that, we've had some unfavorable trends with respect to um, childbirths. Uh, You had the very large baby boom generation. Uh, They didn't have as many kids as their parents did. And so uh, there aren't as many younger workers coming through the pipeline to support the baby boomers, at least in a relative sense, um, as there were when the baby boomers were working their way through the workforce. Now, all of that is is true, and um, all of that drives the financial imbalances in the program to a large extent. There are two other things, though, that I would point out. One is that um, the program would have stayed on a financially stable course had it not been expanded very dramatically in the 1970s. Until the 1970s, benefit levels were basically sort of fixed in law. Uh, They weren't indexed to grow with inflation or anything Mm. else. Uh, and then over time, the economy would grow, and then benefits would become relatively more affordable. And then politicians yeah. in even-numbered years would enact ad hoc Social Security benefit increases and profit from that politically. And in the 70s, what they did is they changed all that. They, they did a 20% across-the-board increase in benefits. They added COLAs, uh, cost-of-living adjustments, mm-hmm. to benefits uh, once people started collecting them. And they also indexed the growth of the initial benefit formula so that each cohort of retirees gets benefits that are higher than the previous cohort Uh by an amount proportional to growth in national average wages during that time. So you have a a lot more automatic indexing of benefit growth and expenditure growth uh, in the system than you had before the 70s. And when you combine that with the demographics, 
um, it, it, it results in costs that are out of control. Uh, final point, you asked about intent, mm -hmm. uh, what the plan was. Uh, I think, as is the case with many government ideas, often there is no intent. <laughs> there, there is no plan. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a major overhaul of Social Security finances to prevent a, a near-term insolvency. Uh, there was a big uh, rescue. It was enacted in 1983. Uh, involved Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and Bob Dole and Pat Moynihan, all the other key players of the time. Uh, and they were just trying to keep the system afloat. And there were just some shortcomings in the analysis that the government did at that time. Uh, they didn't realize uh, fully that their uh, projections of stabilization over, a, over the next 75 years were actually premised on wildly imbalanced operations, big surpluses in the near term, big deficits in the long term. So if you look at the tables that commission worked under, you see only numbers giving how much each provision was going to fix system finances over 75 years on average. They didn't show the commission, they didn't show the Congress um, what was going to happen on a year-to-year -year basis. Oh. So a lot of what is happening now actually wasn't intended. It was a result of uh, incomplete government analysis, and that's a, it's a fascinating but little-known part of the story. Well, and, and I've heard, you know, many people talk about that period of time where, you know, even discussions of, well, if we can just get it to hold on until the baby boomers, without sounding crass, stop, you know, needing Social Security benefits and, you know, we'll survive this wave, as it were, demographically, this demographic spike, uh, that, that it will go back to a more normal pyramid shape, that kind of thing uh, in there. But, Chuck, let's talk about what needs to be done? There have been different things. Some Virginia Congress people have suggested uh, a trade-off for student loan debt uh, abatements. Uh, there have been discussions about uh, just taking the political hit and increasing the opt-in age. Uh, what, what, are some, what are some of the plans that you've heard, and what are the ones that you would advise people to be taking? Well, this is where I'm going to become unpopular with your listeners, I fear, but uh uh, this the the hole is so big now it is so big that you really have to do a little of everything you can't do it all through the retirement age you can't do it all with the benefit formula uh, you know, you, there's just no one lever that you can pull that is going to get you a very good portion of the way there just just to give you some examples uh, right now to balance system finances historically lawmakers have not wanted to uh, cut the benefits for people already collecting them. Mm -hmm. So generally any changes are prospective only, future uh, people who are eligible in the future. If we wanted to have a solution like that today and we didn't want to raise taxes, you'd have to cut uh, future expenditures by 21% across the board. That's immediately starting next year, starting with people who collect benefits next year, hack their benefits 21% and every year after that. And that's what you'd have to do. Um, each year that we wait, though, that 21% gets bigger and bigger. So if you don't think that Congress is going to act this year and you build in a delay factor and, and you also build in the fact that we're not going to do a 21% sudden benefit cut, it's going to be gradual, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you are going to cut expenditures yeah. at all, it's going to be much more gradual. It's going to affect near retirees very little and, and affect younger people a lot more. You start realizing that there's just not enough play there in the numbers. By, by the time you get closer to the depletion date, you could wipe out 100% of the benefits for people newly coming onto the rolls, and it still wouldn't balance the system. I mean, that, that's how many people would already be on the rolls and collecting benefits. So you're looking at very extreme measures no matter what you do. So I, I tend to be in the all-the-above camp mm -hmm. um, because of my own philosophical views and also my analytical views. Uh, I would prefer to do it not by raising taxes. I'd prefer to do it by slowing the growth of benefits. Sure. Um, and I would do it um, – by raising the eligibility ages, and I would do it by uh, reducing the growth of the benefit formula. Uh, there are other changes I would make to change the structure of the benefit formula, because right now it, uh, it's very poorly aligned in terms of work incentives. So what happens is you, um, you, you, you work uh, you, throughout your lifetime, and you have a certain entitlement to benefit. Once you hit your 60s, uh, the benefit formula is such that you only get back a few cents on the dollar for each additional uh, dollar in payroll taxes you contribute. I would make changes to that, uh, and I would 
uh, change that formula so that you continue to have a work incentive mm -hmm. as you get into your mid-60s. And I would do it uh, basically in a way that saves money rather than costs money, sure, <laughs> which sure. means no, yeah, absolutely. In, in effect, I'd be penalizing people uh, who are uh, basically withdrawing from the workforce uh, more frequently sure. and earlier and trying to reward people who stay in the workforce longer. Well, and it always seemed to me counterintuitive. We see this with uh, even our Medicaid expansion here in Virginia. Everyone's proud of the fact that it has work requirements and and uh, even the uh, entitlement reforms, the the uh, uh, Welfare reforms of the 90s included, you know, hey, work to uh, welfare to work programs and things like that. Just uh, why should retirement be any different than that? Uh, Chuck Blahouse uh, from the Mercatus Center on uh, the Entitlement Program Social Security Trust Fund. He's got a great piece uh, in Wall Street Journal. Uh, but, Chuck, let me... Uh, let me go back to something that before September 11th, 2001, was the most controversial part of President W. Bush's administration, which was the idea completely gone on by, by 9.30 on September 11th, 2001. We had completely forgotten about this, but it was the raging debate up until that day, which was the idea of privatizing Social Security. It was uh, give you, you the, almost like a school choice plan for retirement. Um, you know, is, is there any efficacy to that or was that just uh, you know, conservative political theater? Uh, I think at one time there was efficacy to that. In fact, I worked for President Bush at that time, and I tried very hard to help him get a personal account plan through. Uh, and and a, a little additional history there, uh, which I'm sure you know, but maybe not all of your listeners do. You know, President Clinton was playing with some of these ideas late in the 90s before True. other other events derailed his efforts in that area. <laughs> his own, uh, we, uh, his own self-inflicted events. But <laughs> Yes, yes. And uh, those were big missed opportunities. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get that moment back. Mm. We're now in a mode where from 2010 on, uh, the program is running cash deficits. Mm -hmm. So right now, every dollar that workers are putting into Social Security is going right out the door and then some to pay for current retirees' benefits. So they're, they're stuck footing that bill because we missed that opportunity. They're, they're stuck footing that bill, and unless we cut off current seniors – you can't really um, transition to a system of personal accounts without making younger workers, in effect, pay twice over. They'd be paying the full amount for today's seniors. At the same time, they're trying to prefund some of their own future benefits. Now, at one time, we could have done it much more profitably. Uh, throughout the 90s and 2000s, when we actually had operating surpluses in Social Security, we could have enabled people to save those in personal accounts rather than loaning them to the federal government to finance its current consumption. And if by doing that, we could uh, then sort of reduce the amount of benefits that uh, was funded out of tax dollars going forward, and so that they had more of their benefit coming out of their own personal account, it would have really helped a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, um, one of the little bits of trivia that I like to remind people of, which everyone seems to have forgotten, uh, President Bush's plan in that regard would have been ridiculously, fortuitously timed. If you, if you look at the, the uh, transition dates that he had worked out, uh, the plans, uh, the, the accounts were going to start taking contributions in 2009. And uh, that was right after the stock market collapsed. So people would have been buying in at the bottom of a very cheap market. It couldn't possibly have worked out any better for them if we had done it then, but we didn't. So that was a missed opportunity, unfortunately. Well, it, what about uh, this uh, danger, if you will, and I, I see this, uh, that you mentioned this earlier on, that the Social Security Trust Fund invests in treasuries, ostensibly, and we talk a lot about, oh, the Chinese own all our debt, actually the largest um, – proprietor of our debt is the Social Security Administration. Uh, the danger of this two-sided, two-headed monster of the growing federal deficit uh, and that crash that could bring down Social Security, or, or am I connecting two things that, though interconnected in the fact that they own the treasuries, shouldn't be a concern? Well, I think it is a concern in the sense that because uh, the, the Social Security system is sitting on this big trust fund on paper, it, it dulls the sense of urgency. People say, look at this trust fund. It has $2.9 trillion in it. Therefore, we're not at the crisis point yet. But in effect, we are at the crisis point because, um, as I outlined earlier, the size of the changes you have to mm -hmm. make 
to balance system finances, they're, they're so large that uh, you can't wait until that trust fund is drawn down and still have a chance at, at, at saving the system. Uh, and obviously, to the extent that the federal government has to come up with the money to redeem those bonds going forward, yeah. um, that's obviously, we know the federal government has not kept itself in a good fiscal position. So it's going to have to borrow in public markets in order to uh, find the money to redeem those bonds held by the trust fund. So e- even though the, um, the, the trust fund itself represents basically an intragovernmental uh, transfer, it's a plus on one side of the ledger, it's a minus on the other side, the fact is Social Security does have a claim on that money. And yeah. uh, because it has a claim on that money, it, it gets to have it from the other side of the federal budget when it needs it. And then the other side of the federal budget has to come up with it. And uh, unless we're going to raise taxes or cut other months' spending very severely, uh, the rest of the federal government is going to have to float more debt in public markets in order to finance it. Well, thank you, because I was uh, I inartfully asked the question. I was really, you know, going to where you went, which like, which was driving who? Is it the uh, the chicken or the egg? Was it the federal deficit or was it Social Security? And which one is in more danger of the other? Uh, but I appreciate that. Chuck, uh, thank you so much. And, and everyone at the Mercatus Center at George Mason, uh, an incredible organization of economic thought and analysis. And uh, you, you kept worrying that you were going to sound – overly collegial i think you know we very conversational and stuff that hopefully as people hear this uh going on uh because it's one of those subjects that's evergreen as they say in my business um uh, always seems to come up as uh the social security and i'm sure we'll hear it as we come up to another uh omnibus government shutdown brinksmanship in september i appreciate your time with that uh this weekend and and enjoy yourself and uh, stay cool in the hot uh, washington weather Thank you again. Uh, We'll be right back with more Freedom and Prosperity Radio right after this. Welcome back to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio. And joining us now from the Mercatus Center as we continue to spend time at George Mason University, uh, adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School, research fellow for state and local policy at the Mercatus Center. Uh, James Broll joins us to talk about regulation reform in the Commonwealth of Virginia. No, 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 really. That's what we're talking about. Stop laughing at us. James, welcome to Freedom and Prosperity. Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. No, no. Thank you for the help. And uh, there's a piece, if you haven't seen it, in the Washington Post. And by the way, I believe you get a discount if you're an Amazon Prime member. Uh, But originally published in the Washington Post, a piece you penned, a reform that offers hope for centrists. Uh, And it's about uh, the governor's reform legislation and uh, how it's uh, truly in the world of where it's easily said but not easily done, uh, bipartisan. So take us into how you and the folks at Mercatus helped Governor Northam and the General Assembly come to a place where we can have meaningful uh, regulatory reform. Sure. So earlier this year, Governor Northam signed a bill that enacted something called the Regulatory Reduction Pilot Program. And what this new law does is it requires that all the state regulatory agencies count up and begin to track and report how many regulations and requirements they have on the books. And at two state regulatory agencies, um, the Virginia Department of Professional Occupational Regulation and the Department of Criminal Justice Services, they've set a reduction target. They set a a goal to reduce their rules and requirements by 25% over a three-year period. And as you mentioned, not only is this an ambitious regulatory reform, and that they're they're seeking kind of hard reduction targets. It was also bipartisan, and it, it passed nearly unanimously out of both chambers. Um, it it was modeled in large part off of a slightly more ambitious or aggressive regulatory reduction bill that had been floating around the Virginia legislature for a few years. Um, and then when Governor Northam, who's a Democrat, um, came into office, they kind of worked out a compromise uh, that would just focus specifically on licensing. But because it's it's a being framed as a pilot program, it does appear that there's a chance that this is going to be extended to mm-hmm. other agencies potentially in the future. Uh, as far as Mercatus's role in all of this, um, we put out a report a few years ago about a regulatory reform effort 
that took place in British Columbia, Canada in mm-hmm. the early 2000s, um, where they did something quite similar. They, um, they instituted a process for counting and tracking all the requirements imposed by their regulatory agencies. They set a reduction target of, of in their case, one-third within three years, which they were able to hit. And they also put in place a policy where for every new requirement, they would eliminate two for mm-hmm. a time. And then, and then when they hit their reduction target, their one-third goal, they, did a, they put in place a cap, a one-in-one-out policy. The Virginia law just states that a one-in-two-out kind of policy will be considered if they don't achieve their goal after three years of a 25% reduction at these th- two agencies. Well, and, and we've certainly chronicled over the years of this program how the regulatory burden on the economy hurts both sides. But for once, we actually find elected officials in this story uh, that at least uh, for the time being have, pardon the expression, drank that Kool-Aid finally, uh, that uh, we can we can get regulatory reform that, that will also help the poor communities that the uh, the Democrats often say they're out there to help, and also the business communities that the Republicans are saying they're uh, out there to help. How is it we were able to, or or was it just a matter of being such a closely divided house uh, that something like this was bound to happen eventually? So th- there seems to be consensus emerging in a few areas that regulations can can have not just sort of harmful effects on the, the economy or on businesses, but also can have disproportionately harmful effects on various subpopulations that might be particularly vulnerable groups. And one, one of course, is low-income individuals. And there is just a, really an overwhelming amount of evidence, I would say, at this point, that occupational licensing regulations oh, yeah. are a kind of regulation that can have very regressive I- impacts in that they really have a disproportionately harmful effect on low-income people. And that's because they, they create barriers mm-hmm. to getting certain kinds of jobs, which can help you move up the income ladder over time. And very often, the kind of jobs that are licensed will tend to be things like, you know, hair braiders or contractors or, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're the kind of the kind of blue-collar working class kind of jobs that help people kind of get a leg up. They're not they're not necessarily the 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 kind of white collar service mm-hmm. sector kind it, of jobs. And the, and they're um, vocational as well in many cases where this is something that somebody has chosen to do because they love to do it, uh, yet we we seem to be standing in between and in some cases just to start it out, they're working a traditional job while they're mm-hmm. trying to start their hairdressing business or right. their contracting business. And that, that impedes them from making that additional money too, isn't it? Right. And, and so, and very often it doesn't seem like the... Um, the harm that can potentially be done from from engaging in certain activities, like hair braiding is a classic example, or barbers. Very often these kinds of professions are licensed. There can be very extensive um, educational training requirements before you can get a license or sometimes significant fees. And it just doesn't always seem like the harm that could potentially be done from these from people who aren't necessarily very skilled entering these professions, um, justifies these high fees or expensive educational requirements. And and what actually is likely the reason for those those fees and requirements is probably that the people who are are currently in those professions, who very often com- are comprised members of the boards who set these licensing yeah. standards, they want to create barriers that prevent other people from entering those industries and competing with them. The, does this impact uh, a, a topic that has come up here frequently, uh, or is this on a, uh, on its own playing field? The uh, certificate of need regulations that uh, that impact our healthcare industries in Virginia. Uh, so is, is I, I would say this is another area like licensing where the evidence just seems pretty com- compelling and somewhat overwhelming um, that these. I'll, I'll explain what certificate of need is, but. Um, that these kinds of restrictions can are really just kind of anti-competitive. So mm-hmm. these significant of certificate of need uh, regulations, basic, they're like licensing requirements in that they say you have to go to the government to get a permit or a license of some kind in order to build a hospital or get an MRI machine. Yeah, clinic. If you already yeah. have a hospital. Yeah. Um, you, you basically need to get permission from the government, and very often the, the people that give you com- the permission are 
comprised of people who are already in this industry. Um, uh, well, actually, yeah, you know, in, in Virginia, they, they, the, the board, the state will go to the other doctors in the community and say, uh, is there right. room for another doctor? I mean, they would straight up ask, is there no right. room for another doctor? <laughs> say, well, you know, let's ask McDonald's if there's room for a Burger King down the street. Uh, and I know that seems like an oversimplification, but would this regulatory reform impact them? Or because it's a medical regulation, uh, is that something we'll have to wait and see what the results of this pilot program uh, achieve? So it's the reduction target that that Virginia has set. This twenty five percent reduction target is it's just focused on licensing regulatory okay. agencies for the most part. So it, there won't be a necessarily a reduction set um, at whatever agency it is that controls those those certificate of need requirements in Virginia. However, I do think that the, this process of counting and tracking requirements and starting to report this information sure. is is really an important transparency mechanism. Mm -hmm. And and we'll be able to see. The first report is supposed to be due out later this year. Um, And we'll be able to see where are all the requirements Mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia's regulatory code. And so that could really be used as leverage or kind of a starting off point to have the kind of discussion that you're talking about, about other areas Mm -hmm. which seem to be producing harmful effects for citizens. Um, and so certificate of need is another area, uh, and there could potentially be other areas as well. James Broll, uh, who uh, works for the Mercatus Center and uh, it also is an adjunct with the Scalia School uh, of Law at George Mason University, is on with us talking about regulatory reform, a bill the governor signed in, a pilot program. Uh, we talked a little bit about the professional licensing side about it. Talk about the criminal justice side of this uh, regulatory reform pilot program, mm-hmm. uh, James, and, and get, us, uh, get us a feel on what that means, because that's also compelling uh, in terms mm-hmm. of what they're going to be looking at. So I think that um, one of the two agencies that, that is, is really being targeted with this reform is the Department of Criminal Justice Services. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say I'm not necessarily as much of an expert in this area as, as I am on licensing or just right, regulatory right, exactly. issues generally. But um, I, I suspect that one of the reasons this agency was targeted is, one, because it's also engaged in a fair amount of occupational licensing, for example, bail bondsmen and prison guards and people of that sort. Okay. Um, but... Criminal justice is another area where there, there does appear to be kind of a growing consensus um, across the political divide that um, we have a lot of pe- – U.S. has a lot of people in our prisons that very often a lot of – once we let people out, they, they, we're not very good at you know, getting them back on the right track mm-hmm. and getting them in good jobs. And very often there's recidivism where they return to prison. So I, I suspect that that was probably an additional motivating factor for targeting Certainly. This agency, but I'm, but uh, this reform w- is, I, I would say, more focused on licensing um, than criminal justice reform. Although, pre- you know, hopefully it could lead to more criminal justice reform in the future. Well, considering how most communities struggle with recidivism, uh, you know, some you know some ability to create more. Uh, opportunities for people to yeah. work with people in, you know, getting back into the workforce, uh, working through the issues that drew them into the correctional facilities in the first place. Uh, I think, you know, I- again, we see um, you know fewer and fewer people doing that, and perhaps it is for the regulatory uh, hurdles that they face. James, it, when when we look at this, I, I was reminded of um, I think it was a house. Uh, House research project up in uh, in Washington D.C. that had come up with, I, I'm tempted to say, nearly a billion dollars worth of redundant programs, programs that would impact nobody negatively because uh, they would be, you know, they they are truly completely redundant with one another, uh, and so eliminating one would harm nobody. Uh, how much of this regulatory reform do you feel like is going to come down in the world where well, we have two regulations that, for the phraseology and maybe the way they were written or who passed them, they're just completely redundant to one another? So I would expect that w- when you tell a regulatory agency, go out and reduce 25 percent of your requirements, that they're going to start with kind of low-hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. They're going to start with ig- what, like examples with, like what you're talking about. Oh, we have two requirements on the books. They both basically do say the same thing, let's eliminate one. Or we have a requirement on the books related to, you know, horses and buggies from 100 years ago or something, and 
nobody's even enforcing this or it's not even relevant anymore, it's right. outdated, let's eliminate that. And while I think for good housekeeping kind of reasons, it makes sense to periodically go through the code and kind mm-hmm. of remove that stuff, those aren't necessarily the most burdensome regulations. Um, the most burdensome regulations are going to be the ones that have significant costs that are ongoing year after year and really aren't producing much in the way of benefits. They may have very good intentions, um, but may not necessarily be achieving the outcomes that that the designers of the regulation wanted. Um, And so those are a a lot trickier to get at. And um, really, in order to identify those regulations, you'd hope that some some kind of maybe economic analysis or cost-benefit analysis or something like that is used in the review. There's not a lot of evidence that that's happening right now in Virginia, but it's something to maybe aspire towards in the future. Well, certainly our friends at JLARC would say that, you know, they're trying to be that kind of oversight. But uh, that's, you know, again, elected officials mm-hmm. often overseeing the things that other elected officials do. Uh, Fox chicken coop pops into my head. Um, but it, what about the bureaucrats that are being tasked with this regulatory reform? What is their incentive to cut their budgets or to cut their authorities uh, in this? Are, are they being rewarded for compliance uh, because uh, I can see this being a, a, a place where agencies will lose jobs and, and lose funding and perhaps have smaller budgets uh, because of it. So what is their incentive to go that route, James? So the general trend we tend to see across you know governments across the world is that we tend to see more regulation added each year than is mm-hmm. taken away. And so there tends to be more regulation that accumulates over time. And one of the reasons for that is that there are kind of strong incentives to do something about what the latest problem is, that social problem is that exists, yeah. but there are not very good incentives for going back and removing regulations from the books. Uh, and this is true of legislators and regulators. So um, there's kind of a status quo bias, you might call it, that it's easier to just kind of keep things going and sort of make any, try to dramatically shake anything up Mm -hmm. in one direction or another. Regulators tend to view their jobs as rule writers. Um, And so the legislature writes laws that task them with going out and writing regulations. They go to work every day and they they write new regulations. They're not, they don't think of themselves as rule eliminators, really. Um, one One of the really interesting things about what happened in British Columbia uh, 17 years ago or so, is that they seem to have induced kind of a culture change at the regulatory agencies there. Mm. Um, they did this in part by um, putting in place a, a cap where for every new re- regulation you had to eliminate two and then one. Uh, and that seemed to kind of change the incentives of the regulator somewhat <laughs> so that they, they were really forced to constantly be, look back and um, and look back through the old regulations and, and eliminate some, which is, is a difficult um, choice for a regulator to make. It's easier to just say everything's working fine than to kind of say, well, maybe this didn't work as well as we intended. Another thing they did, which I don't think really deserves enough attention, is that, or has gotten enough attention, is um, they gave awards, like red tape cutting, scissor yeah. awards, to agencies that were able to... Um, reduce, you know, their most requirements. Yeah, I, I, um, and I think that's important that you do that because, I mean, I've even seen it in municipalities that have instituted zero-based budgeting programs and said to mm-hmm. each agency, we want you to start from zero. Don't just add 5% on last year's funding uh, mm-hmm. and come and defend each dollar you're spending. Uh, and it's Herculean at first because you're not used to it. But once you get the ball rolling on it, it actually becomes pretty much the standard operating mm-hmm. procedure. What I'd like to see ultimately is some kind of budgeting system set up for regulators, um, where basically they're said they're they're this would also help allow the legislature to sort of gain more control of the regulatory system, mm-hmm. where the legislature says, okay, you know, Department of you know licensing or whatever department, you're allowed to have eight thousand requirements on the books at any given amount of, at any given time, and. If you want, if you want to issue more than that, you have to come get permission from the legislature. Uh, but that that re- will allow some kind of some prioritization or oh, yeah. force some prioritization within the agency, much like a limited budget, a fiscal budget, mm-hmm. requires them to basically allocate funds in a way that can they can kind of maximize uh, their out their 
output given those limited resources. But right currently, the system is basically, you know, regulators can issue unlimited amounts yeah. of regulation virtually because so much authority has been granted to them. And so they don't have this constraint on them. And certainly a fiscal impact statement when you do something like that would be a, a, a requirement. You'd like to see, a, a, you know, the, the business world has a phrase, uh, an acronym ROI. Maybe we need ROR, uh, return on regulation, or something so like that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, cost-benefit analysis is an imperfect tool, but it's supposed to uh, s- sort of get at, at, get at this issue somewhat. You know, mm-hmm. are we getting positive returns year after year with our regulation? Virginia does have some requirements for uh, economic analysis for regulations, but I, like most states, it's fairly primitive, um, especially relative to the, what the federal government in Washington does. Uh, so I think wow. there's a lot more room for improvement in that area. Yeah, certainly it seems to be. Do you do you expect that you, you said later this year we should be seeing the fruits of these pilot programs or at least some of the first reporting mm-hmm. on this? Um, uh, how frequently are they supposed to report their progress, uh, James? Um, so I, th- I know the agencies are re- required to have their initial counts done by this October. So I think you can expect um, in some form or another, the department, the Virginia Department of Planning and Budget, to start reporting the requirements across mm-hmm. uh, the state government sometime around this October or, or soon thereafter. Um, uh, what was the second part of your question? Well, and and how how frequently from that point? Oh, uh, um, I th- so I believe it's every year, if I right, recall so correctly. Annual. Well, I only ask because come October of next year, we'll be heading right into a general assembly election uh, where I I got to figure the results of some of these reports are going to come up every now and then in campaigns. So that's really why I think this reform is can really be powerful is that when these num if these numbers are reported year after year. it provides just a level of transparency that just doesn't exist mm-hmm. currently. People n- get the sense that there's, it seems like maybe there's a lot of regulation, but it's hard to put numbers on it. Um, and so if, if an official government uh, tally is produced, then it's, it's hard for legislators and it's hard for regulators to basically escape the reality of, um, of, mm-hmm. of the system they've created. And if there are, you know, uh, like un- unreasonable levels of regulation in some area, um, then that could really be a powerful way to hold accountable um, our representatives. Well, and certainly the citizens often, if you talk to you know any anyone, they'll find that the the expression. Somewhat sadly is, you know, give a police officer enough time, they'll figure out something you're doing that breaks a law somewhere. And, and mm-hmm. I think that certainly applies to our business communities when they, uh, when they address these regulations. At some point, an inspector right. is going to find something that you're in violation of if mm-hmm. they look hard enough. Uh, and I feel like that's just unfair sometimes. So we have a project at Mercatus where we're quantifying regulation using text analysis software. So we use computer programs to scan through regulatory codes at the state level and also at the federal level. And one of the metrics we use um, to assess how much regulation there is, is we count up the number of restrictions, Mm. which are terms like shall, must, may not, prohibited, and required. The federal code has about 1.08 million of these restrictions in it right now. And the the Virginia code has about 133,000. And a real danger is that as the regulatory environment just gets ever more complex, essentially everyone is violating some regulation or another um, just by virtue of being alive. And perhaps it's impossible to be in full compliance with the law. And that this really creates an environment that could be um, easily abused. You know, if if you're Mm -hmm. a regulator or a a prosecutor or, or a police officer, I mean, and you decide, you know, I want to go after this guy, right. and there's, it's inevitable that you'll be able to find some something they're violating. Can people read that uh, research that you were just talking about at Mercatus.org? Sure. So we have a website that's quantgov.org, stands okay. for Quantifying Governance. So we also have a lot some of these on Mercatus.org, but Quantgov um, r- really lists all of our projects that seek to quantify regulation. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a reg data project, which is 
our effort to quantify federal regulation. We have a state reg data pro project where we look at state regulatory codes. Uh, I produced a report. If you Google a snapshot of Virginia regulation, that's the name of the report I, I produced where uh, we ran our computer programs through Virginia's regulatory code. We found that the code has 133,000 restrictions in it, as I mentioned, has mm -hmm. about 8.8 .8 million words. It would take about 12 weeks to read if all you did was Jeez. read regulations 40 hours a week as a full-time job. Wow. Um, and we, do, we produce you know, charts and things like that that show the biggest regulators in the state or the, the most regulated industries. James Brawl uh, from the Mercatus Center and the Scalia Law School. I uh, appreciate your visit with us this week. You have an amazing weekend, and thank you for helping uh, bring this pilot program to Virginia. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for listening this week. Until next week, for all of us here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy, I'm Joe Thomas. So long, and thanks for all the fish.